All right, welcome back to another After Dark, everyone. Hope you guys are having a good night so far. Hope you guys had a wonderful day. Um, had a request to check out another video from uh, the Thinking Basketball channel. And this one is called NBA Stat Inflation, comparing today's players to the past. And I thought this would be very interesting, something that we talk about all the time in the comment section together. Um, something that I, I don't think younger people and players really appreciate the difference between what was going on back in the, the 80s, 90s, especially 90s and, and the 2000s, up to about 20, mm, about 2008, 2009, um, and how different it was, how much harder it was to score, how much less points were scored per team, per game, on average, and why when somebody averages 30 points a game nowadays it doesn't nearly mean the same thing that it meant back in the day um hopefully you feel me on that one so and why a lot of uh, uh the old heads the old veterans say that somebody like ai or jordan for instance would easily average 35 i mean jordan did it anyways but he averaged 37 one year so I mean, when, when they say, like, Jordan would average 40, that's an easy achievement. You say 45, I think that's about realistic. That's if you wanted to, though. But, you know, Jordan wanted to win first. So, win first, and then whatever he scores, he scores. But if he wanted to, easy 45. 45 per game. And you think I'm crazy now? Don't click away. Let's watch the video, because I bet by the, by the time we, we watch this, you're going to believe me. Um, anyways channels thinking basketball i'm going to link the original video down below in the description uh so if you want to check it out uh without my commentary go right ahead um fantastic basketball channel highly recommend you guys check it out um and without further ado please leave a like to this video um it helps pump it out that way we can push it out to the, to the new gen and yeah nothing else to say for the intro let's do this did you know that Luka Doncic is the first rookie in over 50 years to average 20 points, seven rebounds, and five assists per game? Well, Oscar ho hold on a second. Oh, this video is five years old, so it got even worse from here. This is going to be cool. Robertson last did it back in 1961. You may have also heard that Giannis Antetokounmpo is the first player to average 27, 12, and 5 since Kareem back in 1976. Mm -hmm. There are a bunch of players putting up numbers we haven't seen in years. And it's not because there was something in the water 50 years ago that players suddenly rediscovered today. Instead, <laughs> this boom in counting stats is a direct byproduct of changes in the rules and thus strategy. And those changes have influenced pace, efficiency, and volume that is the sheer number of points and rebounds accrued in the game. But before we get to that, let's first look at how the rules have evolved over the years. Yes, please. One of the biggest changes ever has no entry in the record books, and that's the way dribbling and traveling have been officiated over time. Okay, Here's when you're watching this, by the way, pay attention to how the dribbling had to be back then, or else you'd get called, uh, um, whether it be a travel or a double dribble. I, well, I mean, it would be a... Um, what is it called? Oh, man. Um, palming. Uh, palming the ball violation. So you had to go flat. Like pat, 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 pat. Up and down, up and down. You couldn't do this. Put your hand under the ball stuff and cradle it. That would be an instant violation. And it's all over basketball now. Here's what Bob Cousy, Look at the him, best dribbler of the 1950s, See that? looks like. Palm strictly facing down. Yep. No supination or turning of the wrist. And this wasn't because players didn't practice dribbling. They simply weren't allowed to control the ball in midair by turning their wrists. There's limited film, but Elgin Baylor in the early 1960s was one of the first players to cross over like this, stretching the boundaries of legally palming the ball, turning it slightly in midair during his crossover. By the late 60s and early 70s, average ball handlers were rotating their wrists slightly and increasing contact time with the basketball. By the 1980s, players were subtly expanding the boundaries of legality. Isaiah Thomas was one of the first guards to severely flex his wrist to control the rock, well in the air right there, 
and he even rotated the ball mid-dribble. This was once illegal. By the mid-1990s, advanced handlers were nearly pausing their dribble and turning their wrist completely as they guided the ball back to the floor. Yeah, Allen Iverson was the one who kind of blew this one up wide open with that because they would call him for palming sometimes and sometimes not. So the NBA had to kind of start making a decision. How are we going to judge this moving forward? This mid-dribble suspension from palming or cupping the basketball allows for superior change of direction <laughs> and penetration that wasn't possible in prior decades. Today, players mm -hmm. can complete... Yeah, now, now today, complete hand under the ball and they allow it. Hand under the ball. They turn their wrist over while pausing and then restarting their dribble. This is almost never a violation and allows for hesitation and upfakes as well as superior ball control. And then there's traveling. Oh, Here's a play God. from the 1970 season called a travel. I mean, really, that's one step, one step at most, and no one even bats an eyelash. That it yeah, I've gotten uh, some pushback in comments um, because I have said it many times. Very often, back in the day, you take if you took just two steps, very legal. You got called for a travel. Look at this. This is even worse back then. One step and he got called for a travel. And that's ridiculous. You're supposed to get... It's on the third step you get called for the travel. So one, two, up. You know? But if you go one, two, three, and then you lift off the third, that's a travel. I can't wait till he shows what's going on these days. I count five sometimes. It was called a walk. Here's the earliest Euro step I've been able to find and it was swiftly whistled a violation. Oh, It's been permitted for at least 15 years, One, but back two. then, large strides and hops weren't allowed. Yeah, that was, that was a two-step. That's see, that should be legal. That's two steps. You should be able to take steps however you want, but nope, not back then. That's two points he just lost right there. Flamboyant refereeing was, though. Scottie Pippen was the first prominent star to stretch what we now know as the gather step. Broadcasters immediately called for a blatant walk here, but proponents of the gather might argue. Oh, yeah, okay. He collected One. right now and thus only took two steps. No, I'm sorry. I love the Bulls. He traveled there. That one, they, they, they did miss that. Back then, according to the rules back then, according to today's rules, that's commonplace. By the 2000s, this became more normal, and three step plays are now two, fairly common. Three. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. This became more Hold normal, on. and three-step okay. plays are, All right. are One, now two, fairly three. common. Yeah. Other but formal rule all changes time have made scoring easier, too, such as freedom of movement rules that prohibited off-ball contact like this and outlawed hand-checking above the free-throw line. And, of course, the modern offense's biggest edge is three-point shot, which has stretched defenses thin unclogged driving lanes and you know counts for more points yep now by the way a fun fact a lot of you might not know the uh three-point shot was created in 1978 or 1979 one of those so before that talk about stat inflation <laughs> yeah everything was a two-pointer two points or free throws one point or two point no threes doesn't matter how if you made a shot from half court two points if you have thoughts on all these rule changes, or you just love talking hoops, check out the Hardwood Amino app. They've been kind enough to sponsor today's video, and they have over 100,000 hardcore fans on the app talking all things NBA. Yeah, that's cool. As you can see, it's very visually engaging. They always have topic posts featured, the latest Twitter happenings, and even live polls. Uh, I'll say Jokic, but that needs a video. My favorite section is the app's historical team wikis. These are dives into teams from the past. They're really cool. Download it from the App Store if you don't already have it. Check it out. There are topics on everything like, say, the best stats. That's it's really cool, but just not my jam. But let's see if I can see where the promo is. Boring, easier, or harder. For one thing, there were... Okay, no promo, but... That's just because it's a straight up sponsor, but that's cool, man. Think of basketball. That's cool. You got a promo there. All right, back to it. Way more possessions to rack up numbers <laughs> in the past with pace peaking at a ludicrous 130 possessions per game. 
back in 1962 before downshifting into the more under control pace that's closer to today's game. Illegal defense rules were put in right here, and this led to the so-called isolation era, gradually slowing the game down to seek out one-on-one -on -one advantages. Man, this we've talked about it in the comments before too, and we all agree that's one thing we don't miss about back then was the illegal defense. Man, so many illegal defense violations and it slowed the game down so much. It meant that a major counting stat, like rebounds, dropped as the game slowed down because there were simply fewer shots to rebound. Uh -huh. Over 70 per game at its apex compared to just over 40 at its low point. Wow, that does explain a little bit of the uh, Wilt Chamberlain and uh, um, uh, Bill Russell stats, doesn't it? That's interesting. So Kareem had it rough because because when, when, when Kareem was introduced, the game was slowing down. So <laughs> his stats all of a sudden, wow, his stats just got a little more impressive to me. Not that they weren't before, but that just that just changed it a little bit for me. That's cool. What offensive efficiency looks like over the years, the expansion of all those rules we looked at earlier made it easier to pressure defenses as an individual replacing harmless passing that led to low percentage jumpers with dangerous penetration and kickouts. Pace played a role too. Teams were hunting for more efficient shots into the late 80s before the physical grind of iso ball left teams stuck in the mud in the so-called dead ball era. We can see this most clearly in how low scoring games were as pace and efficiency cratered during the dead ball era. Teams averaged just 95 points per game during this period, as it was simply harder to generate points then, even for the stars. The byproduct of all these changes shows up in something like frequency. I'm of sorry, I just wanted to back that up real quick. Okay, the Jordan era started here, and then it fell hard. So when Jordan was winning championships, it was in its biggest decline ever as far as scoring went this whole era. And then by the time he was done winning his championships, it was at the bottom of scoring. So the fact he was still averaging 30 points a game at that time is incredibly impressive. And this is when Kobe took over. And this is the LeBron era. So just, just make sure you guys understand the differences. So this is when Jordan was winning titles, right here and down, all the way to the bottom of the pit. Kobe took over, and it was very inconsistent, up and down. And that was the end of the 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 Kobe Shaq Lakers. But from here, uh, LeBron got drafted in 03. And um, ever since then, it's been a huge inflation. So the average went from 90... Three, it looks like 93 points a game all the way up to now well i mean this was years ago so 112 and now i believe it's up to 115 so hopefully you guys are understanding the difference here stars the byproduct of all these changes shows up in something like frequency of triple doubles there were triple doubles in about eight percent of all games at one point back when rebounds were at their apex yeah with the recent boom in scoring efficiency and pace, triple doubles are again on the rise. We technically don't even have complete records before 1983, so if anything, this graphic slightly undersells the difference between the 1960s and everything after. I mean, it, it tells the whole story. I mean, you guys remember when Westbrook started averaging a triple double? Right around, oof, what year was that? That was right around here, wasn't it? Right around 2016, uh, 2015, maybe 2014. Okay, so that's still very, very impressive that he pulled that off at that time because it hadn't inflated quite so much yet. But nowadays, we're seeing a lot of 30-point uh, triple-doubles all over the place, and it's obvious why. It's just the pace of the game. Triple-doubles correlate so strongly with these league averages that if we combine league-wide points rebounds, uh -huh. and defensive rebounding rate, we can accurately predict the rise and fall of triple doubles across the league. Yeah, I, I, for, for me, it's simple. So faster pace equals more shots, which we know it's already been verified. 
So more points. So easier to get your, your 10 points there. More shots equals more makes, but also more misses. So way more opportunities to get rebounds. So easier to get your 10 rebounds. More shot makes means more shots assisted, which makes it way easier to get assists. It's not, it's, it's not difficult, but it's funny how younger people don't quite grasp this, that how much it has changed and how one little thing, like removing the hand check and making, uh, making it so defensive players can't touch their man without, uh, without getting a violation, it changed all of this. That's the blue line here. There are a few areas where it's slightly different, but for the most part, a basic combination of these stats predicts how many triple doubles we'll see in a year. Yeah, yeah. Pace and efficiency impact high scoring games as well. This year, about two thirds of games have had a 30 point individual score. Yep. At the low point of the dead ball era in 1999, less than a quarter of games featured a 30 point score. So the evolution in rules and strategy has led to major changes in counting stats and in player efficiency. Comparing shooting in 1962 to shooting today is apples to oranges. What was once superhuman is now merely league average. In other words, in order to understand a player's impact in a given season, we need to look at their stats relative to the norms of that season. One way to do this is essentially to adjust for inflation hmm. the way economists do where it's common to express the cost of something from 1985. Ironically, now, <laughs> he did this right before the pandemic. So nowadays, he could have just shown a chart between 2019 till now, and that would show you economic inflation like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> Guys, Big Macs cost like seven bucks now. The hell happened? In 2019 dollars. If we did that, what would old stats look like in 2019 values, mm -hmm. and would the players of today still be in rarefied statistical air? Before we answer this, a disclaimer, remember the common practice of summarizing players with their points, rebounds, assists, slash line is a fairly crude overview of how good the player actually was. It leaves out scoring efficiency and defense entirely, and even raw rebounding numbers are less informative than, say, rebounding percentages, the share of available rebounds a player grabs. Well, assists in a vacuum aren't much better either, which is why I prefer something like passer rating or box creation. Yeah. With that said, we can normalize each player's points, rebounds, and assists based on how easy they were to come by in a given season. For instance, in 1962, teams were about 80% as efficient as they are today, so scoring 8 points then is the equivalent of 10 points today. We might also want to account for pace, given how some stars in the past used to play 120 possessions in a game, and a typical star today plays about 75. So let's use per 75 possessions as an even playing field. Okay. We can also look at scoring efficiency relative to league average to get a more apples to apples comparison. If we make these adjustments, Luka Doncic would be only the seventh rookie in our new adjusted 25 and five club and the first since 2010 to hit those numbers. His rebounding stands out after Oscar Robertson is adjusted down to 2019 figures. And Luka is the first rookie since Alvin Adams in 1976 to hit 20 points eight rebounds, and six assists per 75 possessions using this adjustment. Yeah, well, Luca in whatever generation, I think, whatever era, is a monster. Because by the time he came to the NBA, he was already a championship back home. Or he was already a champion back home, an MVP. Um, and he's openly said it. He said it's way easier to score in the NBA than it was in Europe. And I believe him. I 100% believe him. And what about Giannis? He's actually the only player with adjusted per 75 averages over 28 points, 13 rebounds, and 6 assists ever. His season still stands out even when we relax these filters. He's only the third player to hit 25, 12, and 5 with this kind of adjustment, joining Kevin Garnett in 2004 
and Boogie Cousins in 2017. Yeah, it's very impressive. Boogie Cousins. And finally, revisiting the topic of an earlier video. <laughs> that Cousins stat just shocked the hell out of me. Video on this channel, James Harden still holds the highest league adjusted scoring rate ever at 36 points per 75 possessions, eclipsing Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant at 35.4 per 75. Of note, Wilt's famous 1962... Wow. Adjusted for inflation, MJ and Kobe averaged the same exact per decimal. That's insane right there. Hey, good recommendation. This is a cool video. Season adjusts to 33.9 points per 75 today. And Stephen Curry's 2016 season is probably the most bonkers scoring year ever. Okay, I just got to point something out because this happens in all of these kind of charts. Okay. Who's the only person that you see more than once? One, two, three, four Michael Jordans. <laughs> it always happens. Other players can have one good year. Like, like one breakout insane year. Jordan was just consistent, man. He's always doing it. That was from 86 was his first one. Oh, I'm sorry. 85 was his first one. And then his last one was in 92. I mean, yeah, that's MJ. Where he led the league in volume and efficiency. Now, you might be thinking... Per possession numbers are fine and dandy when it comes to understanding how frequently someone scores. But what about differences in minutes played and total game production? After all, Chamberlain logged 48 minutes a game back in 1962, while many stars today don't even play 35. So, to convert per game numbers to 2019 values, we can adjust a player's minutes based on how many minutes the other top players in the season played. The top 16 players today average 35.7 minutes per game, whereas the top players in 1962 average 41 and a half minutes per game. Interesting. So I think he's going to go points per minute. That's different. Okay. That'd be a 14% reduction in minutes, meaning that Wilt Chamberlain's 1962 minutes of 48 and a half convert to 41.6 today. We can then take his per 75 adjusted stats, assume he plays at today's league average pace of 100 possessions a game, and convert his 1962 stat line into 2019 values. 39 points, 13 rebounds, and two assists per night. That's still the best league adjusted per game scoring output ever. That's crazy. Topping his 1963 season, Harden, MJ, and Kobe. The two assists per game are a problem, but that's a topic for a later video. Even these aren't perfect adjustments because there are no perfect adjustments to compare stats across seasons. Man, there are some Kobe haters out there. When I say that Kobe was the closest thing we've ever seen to Jordan, but obviously not at, at the level of Jordan, but damn close. Guys, the stats are always, always lining up here. It just their careers went differently and they were just, you know, obviously different players. But man, Kobe really did his damn best to emulate MJ and he did a good job. He did a very good job. The best we can do is to try to understand the impact a player had in his own time, playing under the rules of that time, and then account for additional context, like the quality of their teammates or coaches. But when we compare context. great players to the past, the very least we can do is adjust for inflation. All of the player art for this video was created by Crumpled Jumper. A big thanks to him. I highly recommend following his work. I like at the 538, art. 538, Nylon Calculus, and on Twitter. If you're interested in more about the historical evolution of strategy and rules, <laughs> I created a visual history of spacing that I'll link to in the description down below. It details how teams have slowly but strategically spread the floor over the years. If you're interested in more of these historical adjustments, I do share them with my patrons. You can become one over at patreon.com slash thinking basketball. Thanks again to Hardwood Amino for sponsoring this video. I know many of you already post there, and I hope many more will sign up. And as always, I hope you're having a great day. Having a wonderful day, man. 
great video. Told you guys that this this channel is is really really cool, really cool. The the amount of grind he had he had to do in order to to come up with those numbers, I can't even I can't even fathom. Um, well presented. That was a very 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 interesting video. But okay, so I, you know if you guys didn't get angry in the intro of the video and you actually watched this whole thing and i did say in the beginning if you watch it all the way through i'm pretty sure you're gonna it's gonna prove to you why all of these averages are skyrocketing right now and it seems like any average player can can pull these numbers at least once in a while the great players right now can do this on a consistent basis and this is why we have you know players that are either that can either do it or come close to averaging a triple double because between because it's always rebounds points and assists and all of those three categories are all reliant on the speed of the game and the amount of shots that are being taken more shots more points more shots more rebounds more shots more assists basic basic stuff anyways um i hope you guys enjoyed it i really enjoyed this um definitely checking out more stuff from thinking basketball um i've got a couple more in the chamber uh that i got to check out uh thanks to your guys' uh, recommendations shout me out some more recommendations from this channel if you guys think of any um and you know how this is it's like a supply and demand situation uh i've got with 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 you subscribers so you guys want me to react to it you let me know in the comments and then here we are we come full circle <laughs> It's a very, very good system we've got going on here. Fantastic community. Um, if I haven't said it in a while, I'd like to thank all of my subscribers. You guys are fantastic. Love talking to you guys in the comments. Um, it was not very long ago that I had, you know, just a, just two or three subscribers. I never thought I'd, I'd be doing this on a daily basis. And I'm so thankful to all of you for, uh, for making this possible. Because if you guys weren't watching, then I would just be making videos, you know, maybe like once or twice a week for an audience of 20 just for fun, you know. So thank you all very much. Like the video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet. Um, and comment down below what you thought about this. Old folk, young folk, let's not fight about this one, you know. Let the feelings aside. Just based off of all of this, all these facts that you were just thrown, all these numbers you were thrown, you know. Let's speak on it. So young folk, do you understand us a little bit better when we say that the numbers were more impressive back in the day because they were harder to achieve? And old folk like me, wow. We, I think we, we all learned something about how the game was in the 60s and 70s and why, why we saw those insane numbers, those insane rebounds and points numbers because the game was, was played at a breakneck speed back then. And there were just shots left and right. Um, all right, guys. I'm going to head out. Y'all have a wonderful night. Um, have a peaceful night. Tell your loved ones you love them. Um, and try not to take more than two steps or I'm going to call you for a travel. All right. Good night, everybody. Peace out.